Hello everybody and welcome to the Curious Geographer Live. Um, we are super excited to have you all and thank you very much for our change in times um, for today. So hopefully as many of you can join um, today and if not always you can catch up later. If you are new to my channel, don't forget to hit subscribe to hear kind of everything up to date with A-Level Geography. Um, and in this series of live lectures, we are talking to academics, professionals and journalists um, about a range of geography topics. So if you haven't caught up on them already, then please do. Today, we are really excited to be joined by Professor Elan Kelman. Um, he, uh, professor, uh, professor Ian Kelman is a Professor of Disasters and Health at UCL in the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction and Institute of Global Health at um, UCL University College London. His overall research interest is links disasters to health but also looks at climate change, disaster research and health research as well. So there's so much that he is so knowledgeable in so many different things, but particularly today, what we are going to be talking about is his new book, Disaster by Choice, which was released earlier this year in February. Now, this is such a good book and I would recommend it to all geography students or just anybody um, interested in kind of how natural hazards or disasters affect people from a range of different areas around the world. And what exactly do we mean by disaster? So in this live interview, we are going to be breaking down the ideas of what do we mean by a natural disaster? Is it to do with human actions? What exactly is vulnerability? What creates more vulnerability in some societies? Can vulnerability be reduced? Whose choice it is? There's so many things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and it links to so many topics at so A-level geography and also GCSE geography as well. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Ilan Kalman. And if you could just introduce yourself and tell us um, a bit about what you do. No, hello, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Really appreciate the wonderful work you're doing. And it's so exciting because, yeah, I am a professor at University College London, and it really is a dream job. We just, we just get, get to do so many things. things. It's so exciting, so particularly pursuing our own creativity, our own, creativity, our own innovation, our own pathways. So, so fundamentally, fundamentally, I'm a scientist. So, so I research risk. risk. And, this and this is really the excitement of bringing together health and disasters. Because, because risk, risk just affects us every day. day. We're always, always making decisions, whether it's hour to hour, decade to decade, about, about our health, about how to try and avoid uh, uh, these, these sort of big, big events which people think of as disasters. disasters. And, this and this means that ultimately I can say that I, that I really want my science to serve society. Everything, Everything that I try to do is I'm really trying to help society by improving how we understand and deal with risk. So as I said, it just covers so many things. We are doing new research. This is where the excitement comes in, of us being able to say, you know, I have an idea and I'm going to try and pursue it. So, for example, this year I was very fortunate to start a new project, which is looking at how local places can deal with the health impacts of climate change. So this is going to involve travel to Trinidad and Alaska. We make sacrifices for a job, but really trying to understand what's going on locally work with the people for their needs and generate new science from it, new knowledge, which then is returned to the people and helps them on their own terms. We also do a lot of education, so we do a lot of teaching. And we are very excited, actually, that starting next year in September, so September 2021, we have the UK's first undergraduate degree related to humanitarian issues. This is a Bachelor of Science in Global Humanitarian Studies, so look us up. Think about coming to join us at UCL in order to say, well, you know, when we see these awful tel scenes online or on the television or in the newspapers, and this is what happens after a disaster, how can we do better? Helping people in the aftermath of the devastation, but also really trying to prevent it. And this undergraduate degree, this first degree in humanitarian studies, we hopefully will achieve it. So please come and join us and contribute. We also do a lot of public outreach. So yes, it has unfortunately been very intense with the media due to the ongoing pandemic. And certainly in the first few weeks of lockdown, I was probably dealing with an average of two journalists a day, which is very intense. And you really want to ensure that you communicate properly and say the right things. But it also raises a question, how can we get this sort of interest and attention before it's too late? 
And you're probably seeing a visual on the screen, which was published in The Observer in The Guardian in 2015, where it was very interesting. So climate change is a big issue. They signed this international agreement in Paris, and we're looking for academics, for scientists to, to give uh, feedback on it. So I gave a quotation, uh, which was fine. I mean, it's really good to interact with the media and get the messages out there. And suddenly that morning, I started receiving texts and emails saying, you know, that you're sort of the poster person uh, in the Observer today. I thought, no, I didn't really know that. That's sort of interesting. What they'd done is they'd gone online found a picture of me presenting in Taiwan in 2013 and just used it alongside with my quotation. So hopefully I said something reasonable, hopefully it gets the message out there, but it is interesting that you do have to work according to the media's agenda and say that you may be represented in a way which is not sort of fully scientific, but which hopefully converts our science into something that helps society. So I do a lot of commentaries. I do a lot of social media, so please find me on Instagram, find me on Twitter. It's just my name, Addie Lan Kelman. And then I use LinkedIn, Facebook, and a couple of academic social media uh, sites in order to just get our message out there and to get feedback. Because we don't necessarily do everything correct. And we need to know from you. We need to learn from you. Is what we're saying sensible? And are we ensuring that we are getting our research and our education out into the wider public? So really, that's the excitement of my job and the fun of it, research, teaching, and public outreach. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And we actually uh, reached out to each other through Twitter as well, which is how we got this um, interview, which is super exciting. And I think having you as a university lecturer um, for students who are thinking about studying geography or something related to that at university, then please do. There's excellent opportunities to ask you questions um, as well. Um, I just want to apologise on the half, the half of the beginning. I actually had you a little bit on echo, but it was sorted out very quickly. Um, just actually my audio was going through instead of my headphones actually no going problem. back through. But I have asked the audience and they said that they haven't missed anything and that they can fit, they've, everything's been fixed and they can hear everything. So that's just a holiday for me, probably when you look Sounds over wonderful. it and then it will see you echo it at that. the beginning. Um, if there is anything else or you do have any questions, we are obviously going to be asking questions later at the end. But you can, if you think of questions throughout when we talk about different points, please do write them in the comments and we will get back to them at the end or maybe use them and insert them when we're talking about. So any questions, please just let us know. So we're going to start with kind of questions which I thought about after kind of reading your book. And we just wanted to break down some kind of key um, ideas which were shown um, and talked about and discussed in your book. Um, and the first one was... I mean, in your book, you talk about the idea that disasters are not natural. And is it actually OK to call natural disasters natural disasters because there's such a human influence on the scale of what the impacts will be? And you also say that disasters are long term processes, that they are choices societies make. So surely natural disasters are natural. They are a flood caused from extreme rain or um, a tropical storm. What exactly do we mean by natural disasters and how, how would you define disaster? Yeah, so what it really comes down to is partly a definition, but also partly what we're trying to do with disaster science. And people have debated for decades just the basic definition of disaster. I've tried to take this all and really distill it to as few words as I can manage. And in that sense, I just say, you know what, a disaster is a situation requiring outside help for coping. So yeah, it has some vagueness. What does coping mean? What does outside mean? But you're hopefully seeing on the screen a visual of a photo which I took in Geneva of a car which crashed and, and caught fire. And you can see the emergency response there. That means that something went wrong. Maybe someone made a mistake. Maybe it was a mechanical failure, but they needed that outside help for coping. This applies at the individual level to that driver or to a family going through a difficult time but then it also applies at the larger level, whether it's a city or a country or what we're experiencing right now globally with the pandemic, that so many of us have needed that outside support, whether from friends, neighbors, family, or from the government or from our employers. And this is what it really means to for a disaster to happen. So in that sense, some places can deal with environmental events and environmental processes, uh, and others can't. We then say, well, okay, if, is it possible to actually deal with the flood, which you mentioned, Ellie? Is it possible to deal with an earthquake? 
and we see many places can, and many places cannot. So why? It really comes down to this cause of disaster, this, the element of vulnerability. This long-term process over time of putting people in places and in situations and in conditions where they might not be able to cope with a very simple environmental issue like a flood or an earthquake. That means they require outside help. So it's not the flood or earthquake per se, it's the fact that they need that outside help because they don't have the power, they don't have the resources, they don't have the opportunities to try and deal or to try and do what we know needs to be done. This is all politics, this is all human decisions. And so that's why we say, because it's coming from us, because it's coming from the choices of those with power and resources and opportunities, creating vulnerability for those who do not, this is a human decision. This is a human process over the long term. It is not coming from nature. It is not natural. And so disasters are not natural. Brilliant. Um, and I think that kind of, we're going to be going into lots of different evidence as well looking at different places around the world on this next kind of talk and I think the idea of politics is really interesting because at GCSE students do start students do learn or even younger what are for example the impacts of earthquakes and then also comparing that between more developed countries or areas with higher amounts of poverty and um, they and at A level they really start to break down the idea of risk and vulnerability and therefore like comparing disasters how does how do you de how do hazards compare around the world so like why do we have some areas that have a, a larger impact and some areas that are not really affected as much by natural natural disasters and so this is actually exactly it because it comes down to vulnerability not the hazard and we very sadly have so many examples where the hazard is not necessarily that bad, but yet it creates a horrible disaster, or where the hazards are very similar, and yet the, ha the disasters can be very different. So this is really why it comes down to vulnerability, and, and there's so many examples. One big one, which a lot of us know about, of course, was in 2005, and the famous Hurricane Katrina, where it first crossed Florida, and it was actually Category 5 at that point. But it didn't cause a whole lot of damage or disruption to Florida, even though it was the strongest possible hurricane, partly because it didn't cross over a highly populated area and partly because people were ready for it. Vulnerability was low. It then crossed the Gulf of Mexico and absolutely slammed into New Orleans, created major devastation. It was a national disaster across the U.S. Almost 2,000 people died in the immediate days afterwards. And yet at landfall, at the point that Hurricane Katrina went into New Orleans, it was really borderline between categories three and four. So we had a less intense hazard, but a far worse disaster across Louisiana and then other states were also impacted. Interestingly, and much less known, also in 2005, in fact, just a few months after Katrina, was Stan. So tropical storm stand, it became a hurricane for a few hours, but was mainly a tropical storm, and it raked across Central America. It was much less powerful than Katrina, but in Central America, it caused about the same amount of deaths as the U.S. experienced. So again, the hazard was much less, but the disaster was absolutely equivalent simply because vulnerability was higher in the areas that it hit. Earthquakes are actually another good example. So we can, for example, go to Japan. And Japan is really interesting. So we certainly think about 2011, 11th March 2011, and you'll be seeing an image from that, uh, from that disaster at that point. And this was a tsunami. The image you're seeing was actually an emergency operations center. And the people in there heard the tsunami warning and sat there knowing that they were in danger to get the warning out so that other people could be saved. That is an immense building, three stories. You see that it was well constructed because the frame survived, but the rest of it was washed away by the tsunami and many of those emergency managers were killed. So it's interesting that the earthquake which led to the tsunami was massive, one of the largest ever recorded. And yet the building stood up because Japan knows how to ensure their buildings survive earthquakes. That was a huge success from the fact that so few people died from such a massive hazard. 
It was not obviously a success. Over 15,000 people died from the tsunami because Japan had prepared for the earthquake, but not the tsunami. And we see other analogies with earthquakes. So Japan, again, 26 September 2003, massive earthquake. One person died in the aftermath because they were hit by a car cleaning up glass. Again, Japan knows what to do about earthquakes. Same with California. A few months later, 22nd December 2003, moderate earthquake. I mean, it was about 100 times less than the Japan one. Only two people died when they were running out of a building and the clock tower collapsed on them. And the owner of that building was found legally liable for killing those two people. So had their behavior changed? Had the building been properly seismically reinforced? Earthquake, no big issue. But then four days later, in southern Iran, 26 December 2003, an earthquake very similar to the California one. It hit a world heritage city called Bam. Over 25,000 people died. So that's where we see the same hazard in California and Iran, completely different death toll, completely different disaster. And yet Iran, Japan, and California have some of the best seismologists and best earthquake engineers in the world. They know what to do about earthquakes. California and Japan have done it to some extent. Iran hadn't. The disaster comes from the vulnerability, not from the earthquake or the hurricane. Brilliant. And I think what you've just picked there was just so interesting is the fact that you can be in the same place such as Japan and be not vulnerable to earthquakes, but yet vulnerable to another hazard that you're not prepared for. But then the same hazard across different areas, it can be the same size, but if there are different populations with different vulnerabilities, such as Japan, California and Iran, then you're much likely to have different impacts. I think as geographers, particularly at A-level, you really get to compare different places and actually understand it. It's much more complex because it's not the fact that actually Japan, as a higher income country, is less vulnerable. It's actually, what, was it, what is it less vulnerable for? Who is it prepared? Who, what, are, what natural hazards are they prepared for? And are, is the same population who would be not very vulnerable for one disaster actually much more vulnerable for another one? Um, so thank you very much for kind of sharing and a range of different places and dates that students can really draw upon. And that kind of links to my next question is often the first thing that we do when we look at vulnerability is we compare kind of the levels of development between different countries and hazards. So actually in the GCSE specification, it's asked for well, in the AQA one that you compare an HIC to an LIC. And students can kind of understand that vulnerability, the fact that if you if you are from a, a background that has more poverty and Haiti is often looked at, um, then they might not have as strong building materials. And that for students can obviously help them kind of unpick, actually, yes, they, they might be a bit more vulnerable there. I can see why compared to Japan, where they have a lot more build, uh, stronger buildings and earthquake proof buildings, they won't be as vulnerable. But in your book, you really delve into vulnerability. You don't say it, as I've just said, really then, like really simply, you actually unpick like the different aspects of it. So why does poverty lead to vulnerability? But then also, are there other factors that creates vulnerability, such as gender or age? Like what, what really creates vulnerability? Yeah, what creates vulnerability is us. And even looking at sort of what you said, HIC, high-income country, LIC, low-income country, who gets that income? How is it distributed? How is it allocated? So even going back to the Katrina example, yes, it hit a high-income country, but mo the people who were most hit, the people who were most vulnerable were poor. And the income disparities, the wealth disparities, the resource access disparities in countries like the U.S. and the U.K., absolutely, is what creates vulnerability. So the, the image on the screen is actually from an island halfway across the world from Haiti, which you mentioned. It's from the island of Samoa. And you can see that some people have to deal with these sorts of structures. They have no other option but to build them. I don't know what that one particularly was used for, but you can imagine maybe people are living there, maybe they're working there. And Samoa is prone to cyclones and tsunamis. So imagine a cyclone or tsunami coming in. And that's nothing to do with the people themselves. They don't have that option. They have to live somewhere. They have to work somewhere. They end up building that sort of structure, and therefore they are vulnerable. It also means that those sorts of structures may not have Wi-Fi. 
may not have phone coverage. So even if warnings are issued, are the warnings going to reach the people? And if the warnings do reach the people, are they going to leave everything they own, everything they know, simply because someone tells them to? So this is what creates vulnerability. And it also means that when we look at these other factors you mentioned, gender and age, it's not, it is not actually the case that women are inherently more vulnerable. It is not actually the case that older people are inherently more vulnerable. What we have is we create societal structures which impose vulnerability and therefore make people have more vulnerability or less vulnerability based on these issues of race or age or gender or sexuality. So if we take the example for exa- for, of gender, sort of women and men, then in some places, women are not permitted to be outside without an accompanying man. Certainly, if they're caught in, in floodwaters or in a tsunami, there is no way they would remove their clothing in order to try and survive, because for them, seen in public without clothing is worse than death. These are complete cultural constructions. I mean, it really comes from ideology saying that women are worth worth less than men and women's lives and attitudes should be controlled. If we take that away, we actually take away this imposition of vulnerability on women. And it's not just women, it's also men. In many cultures, men are expected to leap in to rescue people whether or not they have training. Men are expected to be brave. They're expected to drive through flood water, which you should never do, never enter flood water. They're expected to try and rescue people and to be and to be brave. It's like this women and children first mantra for ships, which means that vulnerability gets imposed on men as much as women. And this has nothing to do with the inherent differences It's simply culture saying that women should act in a certain way, men should act in a certain way, which is purely artificial, and this creates vulnerability, which then means we see differences in death tolls and casualty rates between women and men. So the answer is, let's stop creating vulnerability, let's stop causing vulnerability, and let's treat everyone as a human being worthy of living through a disaster and worthy of having their vulnerability reduced. Brilliant. And before we go on to the next question, which is how can we reduce vulnerability? Um, We've had some fantastic questions come through already. But if you would like to ask a question, please do put it in the comments on the side um, and then we'll get to as many of them as possible. Um, If you also have a different YouTube name, can you just put your name so I can just um, refer to you when I'm asking the question? That would be fantastic. Um, So the big question is, how can we reduce vulnerability? We have to make that choice. Those of us who have power, resources, options, we obviously have more. We have more option to uh, talk to our elected representatives, certainly when you're of that age, to be able to vote. Even consider standing for political office yourself. But not everyone has that option. In many countries, if you stand up, if you even try to stand for election or if you try to vote, you will be killed for it. So therefore, we have to say, well, what situation are we in? And how can we think for ourselves, what power do we have? What power don't we have? What resources do we have? What resources don't we have? And then put that forward in order to reduce vulnerability. And I'll actually use tsunami warning as a specific example of this. So on the screen, you'll see a photo which I took in Honolulu, Hawaii. As I said, this job can be very tough at times. And it's when I did a visit to the Pacific Tsunami Warning System. Pacific Tsunami Warnings started in the 1940s. They set that up in the 1940s and expanded internationally in the 1960s. This is a long time ago. They had it down and they knew what they had to do. But for some reason, this wasn't done in the Indian Ocean. So 26 December 2004 comes along absolutely massive earthquake off the coast of Indonesia, leads to a massive tsunami, and the people in Honolulu knew immediately this was big and dangerous. Due to the time difference, it was actually Christmas Day in Hawaii, and some of the scientists just left their family Christmas meal to get into the center that you see on the screen in order to try and issue a warning. But they had no mechanisms. They had no communication lines. People were not aware of what a tsunami is, what it meant. Because remember, vulnerability is a long-term process. Disaster is a long-term process. You can't suddenly say, oh, the tsunami's now. Let's warn everyone and everyone will react perfectly. No. 
there has to be this long-term process of education, as many of you students are going through, so that this is ingrained and so that the systems are there. So there was no Indian Ocean tsunami warning system. Quarter of a million people died. 18 months later, there was an operational Indian Ocean tsunami warning system, which is fine, you know, okay, so the disaster happens, we're very good at preventing the disaster which just happened, maybe people didn't know, except they did. Because for 30 years before 2004, people had used this notion of vulnerability to say we need an Indian Ocean tsunami warning system starting now to make the choices, to get the resources, so that people are aware. 30 years, and there were always other priorities, resources were always put elsewhere, 250,000 people die, and 18 months later we get the tsunami warning system. So how do we stop disasters? How do we reduce vulnerability? It's up to us to make the choices within our boundaries to get the decision makers and those with resources to start this long-term process of vulnerability reduction and of stopping disasters. That, right, okay, I think I'm not on mute. Um, that actually, I think, links to actually one of the questions which was asked just before you started that, before we actually asked the question. So it'd be quite good just to kind of confirm um, what you think about this question. Then I'm going to um, ask you one final question and then I will come back to the question. So again, if you've got another question, please write it down. Um, so the question was, literally just before we asked this one, was are early warning systems a political process or a political decision? The choice to warn or the choice to disseminate the warning? Yes, 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 yes. It is all political. And we do have a challenge that a lot of people look at warning systems and say, just put up sirens, just have text messages. That's a technical aspect and that's easy. But if you suddenly get a text message that says flood coming, evacuate, and you haven't thought about your family, you haven't thought about your valuables, you haven't thought about where you're going to evacuate to and what you're going to do after, what does that mean? Warning systems are fundamentally a social process, a political process, exactly as the questioner is saying, which sometimes uses different forms of technology to help implement. But if we don't understand the technology, if we don't know ourselves what to do, then you can put out all the messages in the world and people will not act in such a way that they help themselves and help others. Super, thanks. Uh, for answering that one and then yes so we'll answer some more in a second but we've been asking all of our guests this and I know that a lot of our students are going to um, kind of finishing school and deciding what to do with careers so how did you get to where you are and do you have any advice for students I know obviously you lecture a lot of students when you get to university as well but for them at this stage what advice would you give to students watching about kind of career decisions um, yeah, from your experience. Yeah, I mean, the advice is decide what is important for you, decide what works for you, and create that opportunity. It is not easy. Resource allocation has made the wealthier wealthier, has, sorry, has made the wealthy wealthier, and those without much resources, fewer opportunities. So you have to take that yourself and run with it and create the choice. And this is why we're putting on the Bachelor in Humanitarianism and why we run master's programs in disasters. So you become a master of disaster, uh, as well as in my Global Health Institute, people who want to understand health much better to give you those opportunities. If you do want to help people, if you do want to use science for society, come and join us. So we'll give you those options. For me, I'd made that decision. And I decided what my criteria would be. And I really wanted to contribute to society. And I found it so fulfilling doing that through research and doing that through teaching. Of course, it's other people to judge whether or not I'm succeeding, and it's up to you to make that judgment, but I'm certainly trying and hoping that it works. So number one, I wanted to contribute to society. Number two, I also didn't want to get bored. Because remember, our job and our career is partly for ourselves. So I want to be challenged, and I continually am. And for me also, I like the independence. I like creating my own pathway. I like setting challenges for myself and for others in order to do what I want to do in that way and hopefully contribute to society. But there's also a world out there. And I realized that helping people meant being local, 
but it also meant being global and both simultaneously. So yes, we do joke about the travel and it is such a privilege and we learn so much. So the visual that you're seeing on the screen now, for example, is a screen capture from YouTube. You can find this by searching for Seychelles Coastal Erosion. And this was a trip which I made to Seychelles and I did the video for this, looking at a very localized initiative to stop coastal erosion. And the government was doing such a wonderful job. The coast was being encroached by the sea. So what they did is they said, well, we need to make this into a park. So we don't want a huge concrete wall. And they used wood stakes to try and shore up that coastline, fill it in and create a park and a picnic area. And it's fairly small, so it's very local, but it brings people from Seychelles there. It's a nice stopping point for tourists, makes a big difference on a small island. It's so local. But then I have the opportunity to bring this to you, to bring this to YouTube, to bring this to my classroom, to make it international. And to say that these big issues of dealing with disaster, these big issues of dealing with environmental change, do not have to be big, global, top-down, like that screen capture from the observer about the climate change agreement. It can be you, working in your community, at the local level, doing something small that impacts everyone, and then others like me can pick it up, emulate it elsewhere, and show the world what can be done at the local level. And to me, having this balance of local and international is so wonderful, and it really is a privilege. Thanks. And uh, yeah, it says your travels do sound like you've been to a lot of places as well. Um, so I, as a researcher, it's really great to be able to see the places and to see the societies. So um, yeah, it just sounds really interesting what you do. Um, the, there is a really good question um, here and um, so we've talked about kind of political decisions and then this question says how can we improve community participation in decision making? How can community affect the decision making process so that they can reduce their vulnerability to an extent the community can cope? Ask them. I know what I know. I know where I've been and the people I've dealt with. That does not mean I know everything. That cannot mean I understand everyone. So the first thing that we do in projects is we ask the people. And when I talk about our case studies like Seychelles, like Trinidad, like Alaska, we did not pick those case studies. Those locations picked us. We were told simply by our networks, by the people we know, that they wanted this sort of initiative. And so we created it in order to hopefully try and help them. One of the interesting and difficult aspects is that when we talk about community, we sort of assume that everyone is involved. But we have to be very careful because it's not always the case. And often communities themselves, always communities themselves, have elites, have people with more power, resource, and opportunities than others. And too frequently, from the smallest isolated village to the largest megacity, people use their power to marginalize and oppress others. So we have to be very careful that we can go into a place and the people will say, well, why are you involving that group? You know, they have disabilities or they're women or they're an ethnic minority. And we have a very tricky balance to say, but you know what, they're still people. And they still deserve the same opportunities. And so we have this balance between ensuring we are asking everyone and listening to everyone as well as respecting local cultural and political practices, and we don't always succeed. It is an ethical challenge, it is an operational challenge, it does keep us awake at night, and ultimately is for others to judge whether or not we're doing a good job, and to always try and improve and do better, but always remember to ask, always remember to listen. Brilliant. And um, I think from me, a question is, and I actually think one of that, that question might have been from India, from a viewer, which is very exciting. Um, in A-level geography or in geography, sometimes we often think about future possibilities. And we've talked a lot about players, different stakeholders from the community to governments as well and their actions. But in the future, we're seeing an increased amount of technology. Do you think, but then we also see an increased amount of population and urbanization of people living in cities and then also the impacts and the vulnerabilities created from climate change which might be exacerbating risk what do you see for 
the future and vulnerability, do you see it there's hope to reduce vulnerabilities or do you think through such as urbanisation actually it means that more people are going to be more vulnerable if, a, for example, a large earthquake occurs? This is such a wonderful geography question because geography is really about people, places and time and this is thinking about people and places in this time. Of course there's hope for the future because we have to create it. And it's ultimately up to us. If we do nothing, if we don't care, then yes, vulnerability is going to increase and disasters are going to get worse. And all of the inputs from, again, the global to local levels are going to create and perpetuate vulnerability. If we choose otherwise, we can stop this. And it's very interesting because cities themselves and increased population density itself does not inherently create vulnerability. If people are in informal settlements, which are often called what, slums, favelas, all sorts of words, if they're treated badly, if they're oppressed, if they don't have livelihoods, if they don't have options, then of course increased population density is going to increase vulnerability and they're going to be hit by the disasters. On the other hand, we have advantages in cities in terms of having more people, more skills, more resources. There can be more emergency services, better health services, and in some rural areas, and more people with the more emergency management and vulnerability reduction skills to stop people being hurt. But that choice has to be made. So our fate is not inevitable. We have to make these decisions to say, okay, you and me, Ali, we're sitting in London. It's a mega city. It is huge vulnerability. There are long-term issues of politics surrounding health, poverty, oppression, racism. It's up to us to change that. And if that question came from India, whether it's some of the rural areas or, again, some of the mega cities, depending on one's resources and options, take charge and reduce the vulnerability. No place, no person, no time frame is inherently vulnerable. We do have to work with people on time scales which are important to them, which means reducing their day-to-day -day vulnerability as well as their millennium-to-millennium -millennium vulnerability. I think you have just encapsulated your book through that the disaster by choice that it really is a choice so we will reduce vulnerability if we take the actions and choose to do so so i think that was a fantastic kind of end um to what's been a brilliant and really really informative live interview so I mean, from me and everybody watching a massive massive thank you um is there any final thing that you've kind of picked up on that you would like to say? Um, but on a whole, thank you so much. And I know it will be so useful to so many students watching. And I'm so glad that we've already had such a, a global reach with this live interview. No, thank you. It's been a wonderful opportunity. You're doing super work to bring geography to the world. And my final thought is really, this is not about only this video. This is an ongoing conversation. So get involved. As I said, find me on social media, ping me questions, point out things which didn't make sense or which maybe I got wrong. And there are actually at least three major factual errors in the book. So there's your exercise. Find them and call them out and we're going to correct them for the paperback edition because we don't know everything. I make mistakes, we make mistakes. So you have to join us in the journey, always judging us, always evaluating us and showing us how to do better. Thank you for being part of it. Well, thank you very much. And I will make sure that in the description we put all of your social media links so that people can easily access them. So again, a massive thank you. And just to let our viewers know what is going on. And I've already had a massive thank you from, I think, a teacher saying the students haven't been able to watch live, but they will definitely watch them later. So thank you very much. And then from me for next week. So thank you again for joining us. Sorry for the internet issues yesterday. Sorry for the echo at the start, but we are so glad that you are all here and that you did join us today. And hopefully many people will be able to watch this on demand when it is up on YouTube. Next week, again, we are joined by another author, uh, Tim Marshall, who is a journalist for Sky News, a Sky News correspondent. And he will be sharing with us all of his wonderful insights on geopolitics. So again, a really, really exciting lecture. If you haven't already, please make sure that you press subscribe. And we look forward to seeing you there and um, yeah, getting your opinions as well because your questions are always fantastic. Thanks very much, guys, and have a lovely, lovely weekend.